summer days in the Midwest, where the life of the community revolved around outdoor pools. For six generations, nowhere was that truer than in Portsmouth, Ohio, where one pool so embodied the town's glory days that it still lives on on Facebook. It wasn't just swimming, there were games, dances, food, and first kisses. It was called Dreamland. This is all that remains of Dreamland today, a parking lot in a strip mall. Its demise foreshadowed a deeper crisis in the city, one of drug abuse beyond anything we've seen in Canada. Many of my friends buried their children. You can almost see the dark clouds sometimes. Just like a, a bomb had went off. What, what the hell you know about that 740? If you ain't lived here, work here. Some call this the unofficial anthem of Portsmouth. See all the tale that we know. Trauma, trauma, depression, drugs, problem after problem. Everybody I know's got Clint Askew and his crew rhyme about the hard times in the 740, the area code here, and its infamy as opioid ground zero, where there are thousands of users in a city of just 20,000. The song's blunt lyrics about the wreckage left by addiction struck a chord with people and was a hit on YouTube. You don't even play it feels like these days don't change. My hands so stained in sin. Ask you noticed an emerging problem as a teenager when pot was starting to lose its appeal. And it started to become like pills. Like all of a sudden pills, people were talking about pills or uh, Loracets or uh, Percocets or something like that. And I was just like, what, what the heck? Painkiller medication flooded Portsmouth after unscrupulous doctors set up shop beginning in the 90s selling prescriptions and everyone around Askew was drowning in pills. And I noticed my mom was doing it all the time. I didn't really notice that at first, but then, you know, after the years went on, when I was able to realize what was going on, I seen it. This building behind me was one of Portsmouth's infamous pain clinics, where patients would pay doctors for prescriptions of OxyContin. These were essentially pill mills, and users came from nearby Kentucky and West Virginia, making Portsmouth the epicenter of an epidemic, which continues today. Now it's heroin, usually laced with fentanyl. The other day, a little girl on by Hilltop, she went home, her mom and dad are in prison. She goes home to her, her grandparents, overdosed and they die. So like, it's around us every day, every day. Portsmouth celebrates its better days, a river town on the edge of Appalachia that grew into an important shipping and manufacturing stop in the Midwest. But the post-war economy favored bigger cities. Businesses started to close, by the 1990s, half the population was gone. Homes and businesses sit empty, and a quarter of those left behind live below the poverty line. Good morning, have a run. Have a motorcycle crash in the intersection by Long John Silver's 11. Chris Lowry grew up in Portsmouth. When I was in high school, I helped build that park. And when my kids were young, I used to bring them there all the time, and they would play, but. I don't bring them there anymore because there's needles. Lowry has flown helicopters for the U.S. Army in Iraq. But now, as the assistant fire chief in his hometown, he fights a different type of battle. We are down here constantly on overdoses. And we find them laying in the streets or laying in the alley. Or I can't tell you how many times we've picked them up laying in this field up here. Lowry started losing friends when the opioid crisis began. Today, most of the emergency calls aren't fires, but overdoses. In Ohio, more than 4,000 people died last year from unintentional drug overdoses. That's up by a third from the year before. And the emergency antidote isn't working like it used to. And at first, the heroin was, you know, we would, we would arrive on scene and, and what we, the Narcan that we use, you know, a dose would bring them out. Uh, pretty easily, uh, but now we're seeing that this stuff is laced with other, uh, 
fentanyl, other things, and it's getting harder and harder to bring them out. If they do come out, this tranquil estate could offer a way out. It's across the river and was built from the proceeds of a notorious doctor who sold OxyContin prescriptions in Portsmouth. Now it offers treatment to deal with his legacy. One of the few growth industries in this region. You're so much more. You're recovering fathers, you're recovering mothers, you're recovering daughters, you're recovering sons. You're recovering employees. Shame and stigma are often the added side effects of opioid abuse, especially in small communities in the Midwest. The staff here say it weighs heavily on the men and women in counseling. More than 30 people live in this facility and it's usually full. There's constant demand for treatment. Death. Biggest fear is death. Anybody else uh, relate to that? Yeah. Why? Brandon Ferguson works behind the scenes at the treatment center. It's a job that came after the hardest work he's done, getting through an addiction to OxyContin. It's similar to having the flu, but maybe a little bit worse because of the mental part you deal with. Um, but it's, it's, it's one of those things I wouldn't wish on anyone. The crackdown on prescription OxyContin in Portsmouth also swept up many users. The only infrastructure in place to deal with a large addicted population was jail or harder drugs. Ferguson is one of the few to break out of the cycle. I think if they would have grabbed it and looked at it in a treatment light, instead of just eliminating it like it did to open the door for heroin, I think they could have got a, a better grasp, but, but that's, who knows. In a town with so much poverty, addiction finds company. So food, clothes, and counseling are always welcome. This church group partners with health officials to distribute naloxone and get people into treatment, or at least try. Get a garbage bag over there and get what you need. Renee Duncan abused drugs and alcohol at a young age. Now she's founded a ministry to pull others out of it. I lived right over there, 21, three babies, locked into addiction, locked into a mess. God brought me out of it. Duncan isn't successful this time. Relapses into addiction are more common around here. Programs are based on abstinence alone. Methadone-based treatments are more tightly restricted than in Canada and are usually only available in major cities, but not in this part of America. Yeah. I'm looking you in the eye, and guess what? I don't want to see you die. For those who won't come out of the shadows, Renee Duncan goes to them. This overpass shelters homeless people who are struggling with substance abuse. Duncan introduces them to a public health nurse. Lisa Roberts has handed out thousands of doses of naloxone in the Portsmouth area. Often, it's other users who end up preventing overdose. So it's critical to know how to use it. So I'm overdosing right now. Oh, hell. I'm laying down. down. Not breathing. No, no, no. Take the pill for the rest. Roberts has worked with substance abusers for about seven years, but her experiences go farther back and are personal. And my daughter became addicted, and I noticed all of my friends were having these issues with their their teenagers too, or young people. And I started seeing my friends lose their kids. Losing kids, tearing apart families. There's now a surge in demand for foster care in Portsmouth and Ohio in general. 10% of babies in the county are born with an opioid dependency. Roberts says harm reduction strategies pioneered in Canada, such as supervised injections and drug maintenance programs, could help reduce the casualties in Ohio. Other countries have things like methadone where, you know, people can easily access methadone at a pharmacy or, you know, a, a close location. That makes perfect sense that we should be pursuing those sorts of things. But the resistance in the United States and in certain parts of it, including here, is, is astronomical. We are in the middle of an epidemic, an epidemic. In fact, it's called the worst public health epidemic in our history. Think about that. Roberts takes her experiences fighting opioids all over the Midwest. Today, she's in Athens in a neighboring county. 
Portsmouth took a lot of heat after launching Ohio's first program that put naloxone in the hands of users. It's now a model others are following, but that's not enough. Overdoses in Portsmouth are outpacing last year's already staggering numbers. My other fears, of course, is that this is just going to be our new normal, which is what um, a lot of people do believe, that we're just going to be dealing with this forever and ever, and um, you know that we will continue to just sort of spiral into um, kind of like walking dead kind of thing. God bless the dead, hope for the best, we all will confess when we all lay to rest. Clint Askew's hip-hop crew is smaller than it used to be in spite of their success. After the popularity of 740, it turned ugly. Then some turned to drugs. I expected a lot from them, you know what I mean? Like, I wanted us to be better and be something everybody else could look up to. You know what I mean? And I still want to be that. Askew has stepped up, stepping in to raise other people's children. Now he has a child of his own. Like making this music is a way for me to have something for my daughter when she grows up. You know what I mean? No matter if I never make it or if I sit here and just, you know, just nothing ever happens. She will always have these memories of me. As the U.S. and Canada struggle to tame a mutual epidemic spreading beyond major cities, Portsmouth shows just how hard the fight can get in smaller communities, unequipped for the battles ahead. Vicadopia, CBC News, Portsmouth, Ohio.